Welcome back, everyone. So today's exciting lecture deals with the topic of friction. We've already talked about friction a little bit as the force that slows things down that are moving. But we're going to look at a different way of calculating friction and basically making things a little more complicated, as we tend to do. All right, so friction depends on two things. The types of surfaces rubbing together in the equation that is symbolized by the Greek letter mu, mu. So here we have the mu. And the other thing that influences it, a lot of people think it's the weight of the object, but more specifically, it's how hard the surfaces are being pressed together. And that is measured by the normal force. Often this equals the weight of the object, uh, but it doesn't have to, and it won't always. Okay, so here we have our new equation, sometimes called the fun equation, if you look at the f mu n. So we have friction equals the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Okay, now these coefficients of friction are usually between um, like 0.2 and about 1. And you'll notice that they're unitless because friction is measured in newtons and the normal force is measured in newtons. So it's a unitless quantity. That This is not given the same status um, as Newton's second law, F equals ma. This is considered more of an approximation. And you'll notice when you think about this a little more, if that's all it depends on is the normal force and the surfaces involved, you get some interesting situations. If you think about a textbook laying flat on its cover, it's going to have, and if you're trying to slide that across a desk, it's going to have a given coefficient of friction given by the materials, the desk and the book, and it's going to have a normal force which is going to equal the book, and so you'll get a certain friction force. Now if you take that same book and you pick it up on its spine, well you still have book material and desk material, so you didn't change mu, and the weight of the book didn't change either. So this equation actually tells us that you would have the same friction sliding a book on its spine versus sliding it on its cover, which uh, I don't know if that's entirely true, but it's actually pretty close to, to a valid approximation. Um, the idea there is when it's on its spine, there is less surface area in contact, but each unit of area is, uh, has a greater pressure on it. So. That's how that works. All right, now we distinguish between two types of friction, what we call static friction, not having anything to do with electricity. Static means unchanging, um, and kinetic means changing. So this is friction for, kinetic is friction for moving objects, um, and static is not moving objects. Uh, a little more technically than that, it's whether the two surfaces involved are sliding relative to each other. So one example is if you have a bike tire, that tire can be moving through space, moving forward, but the uh, surface of the tire and the road are not sliding relative to each other. So with wheels, that's actually considered static friction. Kinetic friction is if the wheel starts to skid or if you're pushing a book across a desk, like I mentioned before, where the two surfaces are sliding relative to each other. All right, let's look at some more details about how this friction shakes out. Um, we have the same equation here for both types of friction, but we have a different coefficient. We're going to have a, now I have subscripts S and K for static and kinetic. And for two given materials, you will have different coefficients for both static and kinetic. Um, but they represent slightly different things, and let me explain what I mean by that. If I imagine that I am pushing on a table, and so here I'm going to graph my push force, and here I'm going to graph my friction force, all right? Uh, first say I'm not pushing on the table at all, so zero push force. There is no friction as long as it's on a level surface, so we can have a point here at zero, zero. And then let's say that I push with five newtons of friction, or sorry, five newtons of push force, well, fr and the table doesn't move, friction is going to respond by jumping up to five newtons of friction. If I push with 10 and the table still doesn't move, then friction will jump up and be 10. So you're going to have a linear response here. 
where friction matches the push force when we're still in the static friction realm. Now if I push up to 15 and at some point in there it started moving, this is going to drop down and then it goes constant like this. So what happens here is we get a maximum amount of static friction. I don't know what it, let's say it was like 13. Once you pushed over 13, your push force kept growing, but friction couldn't keep growing. So now the object starts to move. As soon as it starts to move, you change the type of friction you're using. You're now using kinetic friction. So this part over here is static friction. Once it starts moving, when you've overcome the static friction, and you can feel that sometimes if you're moving furniture, you have to kind of give it a shove to get it sliding. Then once it's sliding, it's easier. Uh, to keep going. So this part over here and on forever is kinetic friction. Interesting thing about kinetic friction is it doesn't change with speed uh, or very little anyway so this object can go faster and faster and the kinetic friction slowing it down remains constant. So static friction changes it can respond to the applied forces. Kinetic friction is just constant. So if we look back at these equations, what do these coefficients tell us? Well, we have one value for the coefficient of kinetic friction, and that makes sense because we only have one value for kinetic friction. But I only have one single value for my coefficient of static friction as well. So, But I have all of these different um, values that are possible. So what this represents is the maximum amount of static friction that you can have. So in a problem, if it tells you the coefficient of static friction is, I don't know, 0.8, uh, you don't know exactly what the static friction is unless you look at the other applied forces. Um, so you have to be careful with that. And that's why we can just have one equation, even though it changes here. OK, so for static friction over here, it responds to applied forces and it maxes out at some point depending on depending on the surfaces maxes out at mu s so that's the maximum amount over here it's always constant you always have the same value and the this graph here, you'll note the maximum amount of static friction is higher than the kinetic friction, and that is going to be true in pretty much every case. So your coefficient of static friction is always going to be larger than your coefficient of kinetic friction. This is also the reason why anti-lock brakes work. Um, what anti-lock brakes do is they try to keep you from sliding when you're braking, so they'll actually pulse your brakes on and off, but they do it so rapidly um, you're essentially pulsing in this area here, but you keep a higher friction uh, than if you started sliding and went to kinetic. So that's why that works. Okay, let's look at one example of the types of problems you'll solve. We'll keep things um, pretty simple, no angles or anything at this point. So if I have a 10 kilogram box being pushed across the floor, and it is being pushed with 100 newtons of force in that direction. Uh, and we're given that the coefficient of kinetic friction is, let's say, 0.8. So I know that there's a frictional force this way. I don't know if it is larger, smaller, or equal to um, this push force. So <clears throat> let's find what this friction force is, and then I want to find the acceleration. It could come out to be zero. You could have friction even larger than your push force if the object is slowing down. So it could be any of those three options. All right, so to find friction, we're going to use our new equation, mu times the normal force. Mu is given, 0.8. The normal force is not given, but we know that it's balanced with gravity. So we can just take 10 times 9.8. So throw that puppy in your calculator, do some mental math. You get 78.4 newtons of friction. So it is indeed smaller than the push force. Then we can apply F equals MA to find, and this is net force, right, to find the acceleration. 
so the net force is going to be 100 minus 78.4 since they're in opposite directions set that equal to the mass which is 10 times the acceleration so we'll get 21.6 equals 10 a and a equals 2.16 meters per second squared and there you have it folks making things just a little bit more complicated by having you calculate friction rather than just giving it to you over and out. See you next time.